picking up the pieces after a thunderstorm hit banks from Silicon Valley to Zurich. Congress, central banks, and investors try to regain their bearings. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard on the effects of a shaken banking system on the economy. Either the banking crisis will pass without incident, or we're going to see some kind of real downturn. Rashir Sharma of Rockefeller Capital on whether there's a price we will pay for all of that government intervention. It's that contradiction that we can't seem to handle. What we want and what's the outcome that we're getting. And former Treasury and CFTC official Tim Massett on whether we should have seen it coming. At the end of the day, this really was about bad bank management. The month of March is supposed to come in like a lion and out like a lamb, but this March entered like a lamb and then was savaged by the lion of serial banking crises. This was a week for starting to sort through the wreckage with what's left of SVB sold to First Citizens Bank shares. Well, this, is a fit, this is a fit that makes sense. I think it gets the regulators off the hook, it gets the FDIC off the hook. I think everyone's happy with this deal. And Congress honed in on the SVP debacle with Fed Vice Chair Michael Barr saying there's a lot of blame to go around. Anytime you have a, a bank failure like this, bank management clearly failed, supervisors failed, and, and our regulatory system failed. Over in Zurich, UBS started the process of completing its forced marriage to Credit Suisse. UBS Chair Calm Kelleher announced that bankers from Credit Suisse would have to be put through what he called a cultural filter to make sure they fit, and that Sergio Amati would return to take over as CEO to make it all work. Integrating two systemically important giant banks is really double trouble. And if that weren't enough, France's two biggest banks faced what could be over a billion dollars in fines as part of a government investigation into possible tax fraud and money laundering. French banks, including BNP Paribas and Societe Generale, faced collective fines of more than a billion euros as part of an investigation into tax fraud and money laundering. In China, Alibaba announced it would try to avoid the government's hostility to big tech by getting smaller, specifically by breaking itself into six separate parts. We do believe that if you break the pieces up, the sum of the parts are bigger than the whole. And it was another week of job cut announcements, with McKenzie adding 1,400 and Disney 7,000, which notably included Ike Perlmutter, who sold Marvel to Bob Iger. Disney has begun the first round of the 7,000 job cuts that it announced in early February in a memo that Bob Iger, the CEO, has sent to staff. And to top it all off, on Thursday, Donald Trump became the first former president in U.S. history to be indicted, with criminal charges filed in Manhattan tied to hush money payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels. Donald Trump becoming the first former U.S. president to be indicted. The arraignment coming as early as next Tuesday. The specific charges, however, are still under seal. For all the drama of the week, and the month for that matter, the markets in the end pretty much took it in stride. The S&P 500 wound up the week up a solid 3.5 percent. The Nasdaq was up 3.4 percent, while the yield in the 10-year added 10 basis points, but still ended the week below the 3.5 percent threshold at 3.46. To take us through it all, we welcome now Lori Calvacina. She's RBC Capital Markets Head of U.S. Equity Strategy, and Julian Salisbury. He is Goldman Sachs Asset and Wealth Management Chief Investment Officer. So welcome, both of you. It's great to have you here. Laura, let me start with you on the equity side. Uh, at least I was a little surprised that the equities held up so well, considering all the turmoil. Look, I, I think there's this view out there that equities are out to lunch and are kind of asleep at the switch, and I don't think that at all. I think the market reaction was pretty rational. I think if you look at it from a top-down perspective, despite everything we've just gone through in the month of March, if you look at economic forecasts, if you look at earnings forecasts, they're still anticipating the damage to be contained in 2023 and 2024 to be a recovery year. And we know that equity investors are ready to kind of move on from 2023 and look ahead. If you look at it bottom up in terms of what's actually been doing the heavy lifting, it's technology. Um, I think investors are starting to think about a sluggish growth environment going forward. Tech normally works well then. But I think one thing we know is that where, whatever you thought the Fed was going to do prior to SVB, your expectations have been pulled in. So I think markets are still trading the pause. They're trading the ultimate return of cuts. And technology stocks tend to be one of the best performing sectors after both of those. So I think it's quite rational. 
So, Julian, you manage an awful lot of assets at Goldman Sachs and equities, but going well beyond equities. What are you seeing? If in equities it seemed pretty solid throughout the thing, what are you seeing in bonds? What are you talking, seeing in alternative investments? Well, first of all, on the equity side, it is kind of extraordinary if you look back at the events of the last month. And here we are, we're ending the month up, up 3 or 4%. If you'd you know, known at the beginning of the month, like the events that were going to unfold, I'm not sure you would have predicted that. You know, what, what we're seeing right now is, um, you know, on, on, the, on the alternative side, continued demand and interest in alternative asset classes, you know, given the volatility and uncertainty of the environment. So I would say private credit, private real estate uh, are still attracting a lot of interest. We're still seeing sluggishness in terms of interest in, in private um, equity and growth equity, but these, the more kind of yielding income producing assets are, are attracting people because of the, low, of the higher base rate environment. So the actual nominal yield on these asset classes is interesting to investors. So, so did the turmoil in the banks, Julian, actually help the bonds in the sense that people rushed into bonds, they wanted to buy more bonds because they were so uncertain of where we were going? Now, I think there were two things. First, the you know, flight to quality generally. So you saw money moving um, out of weaker banks into stronger banks from a from a deposit perspective, you also saw very significant um, fund flows into money market funds. I mean, we saw, I think as a matter of public record, $52 billion of flows into our money market funds in a two-week period. Mm. Uh, just example of people looking to really, uh, uh, you know, move their money out of, again, weaker banks into more diversified risk. Also seeing people moving into bonds and other, um, you know, income-producing assets. Um, and, and then I would say, um, uh, you know, again, like p pushing out a little bit of duration now in expectation that wherever, uh, I agree with Laurie's point, whatever you thought the path of rates was going to be, you know, the, the, the peak rate and the time horizon in which rates start to roll over has probably come in because of the dampening effect that this is having on the economy. So, yeah. Laurie, if in fact uh, in the bond situation people like the safety, relative safety of bonds, is there an equivalent in equities? Are you seeing, because of some of the turmoil with the banks and still yeah. uncertainty about the economy, are there certain equities that people tend to go to when they're a little unsure of the future? There are. And, you know, things like utilities, health care, consumer staples, you know, are, tend to be where people go big caps in general. So we've seen small caps underperform. But technology stocks, interestingly, over the last, I would say, like five or six years, have become another safe haven. And we we know that areas like utilities, consumer staples have been highly overvalued because people were really pushing into them last year when they were moving out of tech. And so I actually think, you know, it's interesting. Tech had already been, I think, largely de-risked last year. So people feel comfortable now coming back to it as more of a safety trade. Julian, one of the things people talk about is a possible credit crunch yep. in react to action of what happened with the banks. Mm -hmm. uh, is, are people uh, providing for that? Are there mm -hmm. ways to provide for that? Or do you see a credit crunch around the corner? Sure. Look, I think uh, the, the, the very acute near-term issue has been taken off the table. I think the policy actions to stabilize the, bank, the liquidity around the banking system has proven to be effective. Um, but I do think there are uh, a few things that are fairly certain. For the sub $250 billion banks that have been subject to less stringent capital and, and liquidity requirements, they're going to be sub required to hold more capital. They're going to be required to hold more liquidity. The cost of uh, they're going to charge for their borrowers is therefore going to go up. Uh, they're also going to be subject to greater regulation. So I think credit availability is going to become tighter. Whatever you thought it was going to be, it's certainly going to become tighter as a result of these actions. And that is going to impact certain areas of the economy, particularly, I think, commercial real estate, which was already feeling very, very fragile. And this is going to be, you know, just further uh, add to the pain. Okay, Julian Salisbury and Lori Calvacino will be staying with us as we turn from where we are in the markets to where we are headed in the markets. That's coming up next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Some quarter, huh? Heck, the three months in the financial world that ended tonight provided at least three times the usual thrills and spills. So it wasn't just a quarter, it was at least 75 cents. And what did it all mean? Why, well, almost anything you wanted it to mean, provided you picked the right two bits. That was Louis Ruckheiser at the end of a tumultuous march back in 2000. It sounds a lot like today, frankly. But then the number one movie in the country was Aaron Brockovich, starring Julia Roberts. And the number one song, well, that was Say My Name by Destiny's Child. Still with us are Julian Salisbury of Goldman Sachs and Lori Cavasina of RBC Capital Markets. So, Julian, let's start with you here. Uh, one of the things we've seen is a, apparently a pulling back by the banks in making loans. 
What does that mean as an opportunity potential for private credit? Sure. I mean, one of the reasons the banks are being forced to pull back right now is concerns around their own liquidity situation. Um, you know, liquidity kills banks, not, not uh, solvency generally. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at the private credit market. Somebody was asking me about this the other day, you know, what, what's going on with these shadow lenders? And I said, this wasn't a shadow banking problem. This was a banking problem, classic asset liability mismatch problem. The private credit market, very differently, generally the participants in that market have very long dated liabilities. So they have the ability to be consistent and thoughtful about the way they deploy capital. They're not subject to redemptions. They can be a consistent relationship lender to private equity firms. So when they see an opportunity where the markets step back, capital markets are closed, they can come in and, and be a provider of choice uh, and enable private equity transactions to take place. So it's, a, it's an attractive asset class, it's defensive in nature, it's floating rate in nature. And at a time like this, you can um, extract a particularly attractive uh, credit and illiquidity premium. Is there any transparency risk in private markets? That is to say, in public markets, you sort of know where the value is. Private markets, you're not quite as sure. And right now, we've seen some hidden liabilities we didn't know were out there. Uh, look, it, it, it's, a, it's a great question. And I do think uh, the discipline of being held to account minute by minute in the public markets is a great discipline. But there are, um, you know, there are also certain types of businesses that benefit from growing and scaling outside the uh, you know, without being subject to you know the day-to-day -day, uh, scorecard essentially you know certain types of businesses that don't aren't profitable for a long period of time sometimes are better off being built and compounded in uh, in, in private market format um, so look it's a, it's a it's a great question but I, I think generally what you find is these are large sophisticated investors managing this mm. this, this these pools of money and uh, you know there's there's upsides to that as well because you're not forced out of the trade you can carry the trade so you can take a long-term view of value rather than thinking what's going to happen over the next one week three months or six months Laurie uh, there's some debate about whether we should call this a banking crisis it was a crisis for Silicon Valley banks and that clear it's for a crisis for the banking industry overall but it certainly was a lot of turmoil I know that you have specifically looked back in the past at some similar crises or points of turmoil uh, and you actually took a look at the Nasdaq one during some of those. Take us through that. We have a chart to show. Yeah, so, you know, I'm, I'm a great student of history when it comes to markets. And I think this is going to end up having its own name. It's going to be its own unique crisis. But to me, this is more like WorldCom than it was like Bear or Lehman. And we took notice of the fact that the banks were trying to stabilize recently. Um, and so we went back and essentially looked at kind of the problem industries in both that 2000, 2003 period and the financial crisis. And what we found was that after both Bear and Lehman, you basically saw the banks continue to act really, really poorly. If you go back, though, to the tech bubble period, we saw that after WorldCom, NASDAQ 100 actually stabilized um, and kind of entered this very long, lengthy bottoming process. So it wasn't quite a clearing event. It was something close to it. But it did sort of, you know, it was sort of cathartic in a sense that, you know, some of these excesses uh, were exposed and dealt with. And then the market, you know, took some time to heal, but ultimately was able to move on. So, Laurie, help us make a little money here. Uh, as you look at the equity markets right now, where are things you think underpriced? In fact, that you might be able to make you find some bargains. So, you know, I've been hoping that industrials would get cheap in all this, and it didn't. Um, we're neutral that sector. Um, but one area we've been watching really closely is the small caps. Now, obviously, the banks and financials are a big drag there, but that's not the only part of small cap that's been underperforming in here. Consumer stocks have been underperforming, tech stocks, energy stocks within that small cap landscape. So we would say, you know, if you don't want to just sort of go all in on the small cap space, generally try to look at some of those non-financial sectors to find some babies that have been thrown out with the bathwater. Julian, the same question to you more broadly, not just equities, but including debt, including alternatives, other possibilities. Where are there bargains are in a, that you're looking at? Yeah, Look, I, I think uh, we, on the public credit side, I think investment grade credit um, is, is an attractive area to be right now. Um, you're, you're getting paid a pretty, you know, getting paid 5% plus nominal rates of return for owning pretty low risk credit. And, you know, given some concerns about the softening economic environment, saying higher in quality, pushing out duration a little bit, benefiting from what's likely to be eventually a rollover in the, in the rate curve. Um, so I think that's one area. And then I said on the, on the, on the private side, uh, it, it's more of the credit-like products. Private credit for corporates, private credit for real estate is where we're seeing the biggest opportunity set right now. Uh, really quite extraordinary, especially on the, on the real estate side. We're still seeing limited, more limited opportunities to deploy capital on the private um, equity primary side and in the growth equity side where we're still seeing, back to this point about 
the discipline of a public markets. That's starting to roll through in terms of private growth equity, but that valuation reset hasn't fully happened. I think that's going to roll through, and we'll start to see great opportunities six and 12 months from now. Um, but we're, where we are seeing is on the secondary private equity side. So this is owners of private equity assets that are looking to uh, essentially rebalance their portfolio because they've suffered the denominator effect. They found themselves longer than they would like to be because their bonds and equities went down. The, uh, the non-mark-to-market private assets stayed where they were. So, you know, we're seeing interest in people uh, investing in um, private equity secondaries. Uh, Laurie, if you go in the way back machine, all the way back to the beginning of March, 30 yeah. days ago, <laughs> we were worried about inflation and what the Fed was going to have to do and would we go into a recession. Are we getting a little complacent on the question of what the Fed's going to do and the possibility, real possibility of a recession? Well, look, I think that the word accelerant is what's really stuck in my head from the past week. And I really worried when I put my year ahead outlook out that we were going to get to September, October and still be debating whether or not we were about to tip into a recession. Um, I think that, you know, when we talk about lending, for example, slowing down, we already knew that was going to happen. Did this crisis sort of accelerate that trend? Um, are businesses that were already starting to lay people off are going to bring that forward? It, it's not fun. It's not something we want to see. Um, but frankly, from a market pricing perspective, I think you're a little bit better off having that damage contained in 2023 than 2020 bleeding in. So I don't think we're complacent, but I think, you know, I've talked to a lot of people this past week, you know, the question, what's changed in your view? Um, I don't think a lot of thing has really, things have really changed in people's longer term views. Maybe just the path to how we get there is a little bit different. It's amazing we've gone through all that and people's views haven't changed that much. Yeah. Thank you so very much. It's great to have both of you with us. That's Julian Salisbury of Goldman Sachs and Lori Cavasina of RBC Capital Markets. Coming up, we're going to talk with Rashid Sharma of Rockefeller International. He's chairman there, and he has written a piece about the price we may be going to pay for all that government intervention in the financial markets. We certainly have seen a lot in the banking sector this month. That's coming up next, and we are on Wall Street Week, and we are on Bloomberg. Week. I'm David Weston. As the month of March draws to a close, it looks like maybe all of the uncertainty about the banking system is starting to quiet down, helped in large part by the U.S. government stepping in once again, this time to ensure deposits of people in Silicon Valley Bank. Rashir Sharma has taken a look at exactly what that might have for implications more broadly for the economy. And welcome now. Rashir Sharma, of course, is the founder of Breakout pa Capital Partners, as well as chairman of Rockefeller International. Rashir, welcome back to Wall Street. Week. Great to have you here. Uh, once again, Thanks. the government rides to the rescue here. That's good news for the people being rescued. But what possible ramifications might it have more broadly? Yeah, I think, David, this is a great time to step back and see as to how low the bar has become now for government intervention. Uh, now, of course, the banking sector is always a very sensitive uh, sector because of the risk of a contagion. But what strikes me here is that how far we have come uh, over the past few decades where you get more and more stimulus, more and more government intervention, and at the same time, you have a slump in productivity growth. And I think that this is the point that is very underappreciated at the surface. It seems as if the economy uh, has once again survived a crisis, uh, and here we are. But I think what we forget is that that is a price we are paying for this, uh, that because of this constant government intervention, we're keeping alive a lot of zombie companies in this country. And the number of startups, in fact, over time is going down. Uh, so what? why is this happening? This is happening because we're keeping a lot of dead wood in the system. The number of zombie companies in the, uh, America today is nearly 20% of all companies can be classified as zombie companies. That number used to be barely 2% uh, in the 1980s or so. So that is the contradiction here, which is that we do not want to, uh, any pain, and that's completely justified, and we want the government to come to the rescue, but we also don't like the economic outcome where we have low economic growth, less and lesser living standards, and that I trace back to the fact if you have low productivity, that's what you will get, and the low productivity is the direct consequence, I think, 
of such expansive government intervention. So, Rusher, no question we've had a lot more government intervention, no doubt about that. But there's another factor as well. We've had very, very low interest rates, which has allowed some of those so-called zombie companies, companies that basically can't afford, afford to service their own debt, survive. As the Fed has moved to a higher interest rate uh, regime, might that help some on the front of zombie companies, the allocation of capital, and therefore maybe ultimately productivity? It could be, but so far there's very little um, evidence of it. Look at the default rates. Uh, you know, the default rates are so low in the country today. Uh, now, as you know, that in capitalism, having some default rates is a very essential part of it. So this goes back to what sort of system do we want? So the default rates in the economy today are very low. Now, all this sounds almost a bit masochistic, that do we want more pain? Do we want more companies to go bust? Well, if you want capitalism, that's what you should be prepared for, uh, because a capitalist economy should be a dynamic economy where you have much greater company creation, you have a lot of the dead wood that dies, and you don't have the creation of too many monopolies or very large companies that benefit also from very low interest rates, as we know. Uh, so I think that it's that contradiction that we can't seem to handle what we want and what's the outcome that we're getting. Rushir, do you think there might be a way to engineer this in such a way that you take away the worst of the pain and yet you still have some discipline in the market? And let's, let's take the example of Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, to be sure, all the depositors were guaranteed they were to be made safe. But the bondholders were wiped out, the shareholders were wiped out, management was wiped out. It's not exactly moral hazard, is it? But uh, as I said, that looking at each individual instance almost seems justified. I'm looking at the cumulative effects here, that if you have so much government intervention, which is constantly at hand, uh, then what are the consequences of that? So each individual instance, it's very hard to argue against uh, because no one likes to see that kind of pain. But what is it that we are seeing? We are seeing the size of government stimulus over time having increased massively. Uh, if you look at each economic downturn, we have seen the size of monetary stimulus increase a lot as we have seen every economic downturn. And we've seen lesser and lesser defaults because often the government's intervening also in a non-monetary and a non-fiscal way, like this sort of did just now. So put this in a larger context. I mean, it's not just uh, the, uh, we will call it bailout, don't call it bailout, but whatever happened with Silicon Valley Bank, it's not just that. At the same time, we're moving, at least stepping into the area of industrial policy with things like the Chips and Science Act and federal government putting money into things like semiconductors. Are we overall in our society uh, slowly, maybe not even slowly, moving away from a true free enterprise system to something that's much, much more statist? Yes, I think that's already happened. All the evidence suggests that. Look at the share of government uh, in the total economy. Uh, that uh, uh, keeps going up over time. The No major developed economy since the 1970s has ever run a sustained fiscal surplus. Everyone's used to now running only deficits because we think deficits don't matter. And my point is that all these things do matter in an insidious way, that you're undermining the fabric of capitalism, you're undermining the dynamism of capitalism, and the result you have today is something which is much close to statism, as you point out as well. I, I think it's correct. After all, industrial policy is something we so associated with China uh, in the past. So I think that this is the big change in America and the consensus out here that there's so much more that the government is doing in every area. There's mission creep in the Fed as well, uh, in terms of what all it's doing. So that is my central point out here, which is that productivity growth in America, uh, if you look at total factor productivity growth, is has fallen to just half a percent a year now. That number used to be 2% or more. So that is the dramatic change that we have seen. Such a pleasure to have you with us. Very illuminating. Thank you. That's Rashir Sharma. He is chairman of Rockefeller International. Coming up, another banking shakeup, another one the ratings agencies didn't help us see coming. We ask former Treasury official and CFTC chair Tim Massett whether there's a better early warning system. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Safeguarding the banks. We thought the Dodd-Frank regulations coming after the great financial crisis had put systemic banking risk behind us. Well, I think we start with what the stress test showed. And what they showed is how incredibly well 
capitalized the U.S. banking system is. It's not just the numbers, it's what's behind the numbers. But then it hit us like a tsunami, with the sudden collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, followed in short order by Signature Bank. I think we've got to recognize that the, you know, it was the second largest bank failure in U.S. history, followed by the third largest bank failure in U.S. history, when Signature Bank was taken over as well. And then the big one, Credit Suisse. Credit Suisse. Let's call it what it is, essentially failed over the weekend and got taken over by UBS. As the system appears to be settling down, it's time to figure out what went wrong with bank management. Anytime you have a, a bank failure like this, uh, bank management clearly failed, supervisors failed, and, and our regulatory system failed. And with regulation. We know first that there was a significant supervisory failure somewhere along the way leaving us to ask, how do we make sure we don't go through all of this again? And to give us a sense of maybe what went wrong with our early warning system, welcome now Tim Massett. He was there to pick up the pieces after the great financial crisis as Assistant Secretary of Treasury and then going on to being the chair of the CFTC. He is now a fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School. So, Tim, thanks so much for being here. So give us your sense of maybe what went wrong. Why didn't we see this coming? What happened with Silicon Valley Bank and then Signature? Well, thank you for having me, first of all, David. You know, I think we can point to a few things. Um, and we'll know more after the Fed completes its review of what happened uh, with, with supervision during this time. But um, it appears to be that the regulators at least are saying, based on what's come out so far, that they did give some warnings. Uh, the management doesn't seem to have acted on those. At the same time, the rating agencies didn't see this coming, but neither did most Wall Street analysts. And while we can do all those sorts of post-mortems, at the end of the day, this really was about bad bank management from, from my standpoint. I mean, this is a management that didn't have a credit risk officer, chief risk officer, and really overestimated the stickiness of its deposits. Uh, I think that was one of the main things. So I think really, as we do all these postmortems, the question really should be focused on why didn't management do more to prevent this sort of thing from happening. Hindsight's always 2020, in my experience right. at least. It's easy in retrospect. But looking back at it now, and it's and it's the ratings agencies, it's the regulators, it's even the stocks analysts. If you look at what they had, they had a yep. price on the stock exactly. of like $231 just before it went to zero. And yet the risk was interest rate risk. It was not a secret that the Fed was raising rates and raising them rather substantially, rather quickly. Right. I think that's right. And obviously, a lot of banks had that. But that's where I think we really do have to recognize that what was particular about Silicon Valley was its deposit profile. Um, you know, its deposits were concentrated in the venture industry. That is an industry where I think you've got to expect the deposits will not be sticky. And so, you know, we've talked a lot about when interest rates rise, people should have realized that on the asset side of the balance sheet, they were now exposed to losses. Yes, that's true. But it's also the effect of interest rate rises on the deposit side. Those deposits are going to become even uh, more hot in a way as people look for hot, higher yields. And the firms that were using uh, SVB obviously were facing uh, more challenging operating environments, needed more money. So you had conditions building up uh, that could easily lead to a flight of deposits. And I think this is a management that just appears to have always overestimated uh, the stickiness uh, of those deposits. And in an age of social media, we, we almost have to redefine stickiness entirely because, you know, how quickly this this run happened was really striking. I mean, to have 40 billion in deposits basically leave in a day uh, was pretty incredible. And that raises the question, Tim, that's been raised by others, actually. How much of this is technology that basically our systems, whether it's ratings agencies or regulators or whatever, haven't kept up with the technology because people could withdraw their deposits just with their smartphone instead of having to line right. up at the bank. And does that raise real issues, for example, for the ratings agencies, that they cannot yeah. keep up with the speed of light? No, they can't. And again, I'm sure, you know, if you're in a rating agency, you also don't want to cause the bank run. Uh, the real question, I think, is how do we have a system where a bank can fail uh, without it triggering a systemic problem? And that may really 
require us to kind of rethink the banking model. Uh, do we need different types of banks for different purposes? You know, narrow banks that do more limited functions and where we could maybe have guarantees of all the deposits versus banks that, you know, are more engaged in creating credit and are subject to um, different sorts and tougher requirements. I think we may have to start thinking a little bit more broadly about how we're defining banking and uh, you know, in order to really get to a system where you can have risk and have failure without it requiring you know government bailouts and, or posing a, a systemic risk. Uh, Tim, uh, uh, eventually, of course, the government did step in and guarantee all those deposits without limit. Take us back to 2008, 2009. Is the current system, the way it's structured, does it require the Fed and the agencies basically to allow a bank to fail before it has the statutory authority to step in? Yeah, that's absolutely right, David. In 2008, the FDIC did come up with a way to guarantee all bank deposits when the crisis really started to escalate after Lehman failed. They guaranteed all deposits, and they also put in place a guarantee of new bank indebtedness. Now, they used what was called the systemic risk exception to do that, but traditionally, the systemic risk exception was only used in the case of a failed bank. And in the case of a failed bank, you could make certain changes, including uh, guaranteeing all the deposits if that was going to minimize the cost to the FDIC. After 2008, when we implemented Dodd-Frank, the FDIC's ability to guarantee all deposits uh, of uh, solvent banks was taken away. You can only do that with the approval of Congress. So they were just left with the traditional interpretation of the systemic risk exception, which is if a bank fails, then they can, when they step in and seize it, then they can do certain things to minimize costs, including guaranteeing deposits. That is what they did for SVB. Uh, but when people say, well, this means all deposits are guaranteed, well, actually right now it doesn't mean that uh, because they don't have that power. Did that increase the risk of the system, in your judgment, Tim, having been there at the time in 2008, 2009? Does it increase the risk to say you have to go actually over the edge of the waterfall before you can really rescue them? Sure. I mean, look, I think coming out of 2008 and Dodd-Frank, we did a lot of things to strengthen the system. We increased bank capital. We put in other prudential safeguards. And that was all very good. But we also limited some of the tools that we have to deal with the crisis. And we didn't have great tools to begin with. Now, it is true in Dodd-Frank, we added a tool or two, such as the orderly liquidation authority, which allows uh, the FDIC to seize a non-bank. But I think, you know, when you look at the US relative to say Japan or Europe, our crisis fighting tools are more limited. Now, that's because of very, uh, legitimate concerns about moral hazard. You know, we don't like government stepping in uh, and uh, guaranteeing, you know, a failed bank or something like that. But nevertheless, you want to prevent a systemic crisis. So, you know, balancing those two things is a hard thing. Uh, we may have erred, however, on the side of taking away too many tools, um, forcing, you know, uh, regulators would have to go to Congress uh, and you never know whether uh, Congress will act quickly enough. But again, it comes back to how do we design, design a system where you know, the government doesn't have to step in uh, just because you have uh, bad management at, at one bank, or you have to step in, but you don't have to you know, do something systemic. Tim, from your experience, where do you come out of the moral hazard question? I mean, in this instance, uh, the government came in and guaranteed all the deposits, although, as I understand it, the shareholders and the bondholders got wiped out. Is that enough yep. to take care of the moral hazard? I mean, there's enough of a penalty that the next bank management is not going to try to do that again. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look, there's always going to be moral hazard in these situations. You're, you're faced with a set of bad choices uh, when something like this happens. And, you know, you end up having to, to pick the least bad of those choices. And when you do what the FDIC did, you know, there's obviously going to be some moral hazard uh, consequences of that that you don't like. But the alternative was far worse. I do think uh, the fact that, uh, you know, management was kicked out, uh, bondholders were wiped out was good. Um, one of the things is, though, that, you know, the holding company was still there. Uh, 
I do have some questions about why that was, uh, you know, should, should something more have been done there? Okay, Tim, thank you so much. It's been very helpful. That's Tim Massett. He's now a fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School. Coming up, we wrap up the week with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. I'm delighted to see we're back with our very special contributor. He's Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, let's talk about inflation. We got those core PCE and other PCE numbers in this week. We know the Fed pays attention to them. They were a little bit better than they had been. Yeah, they were. I don't think one should make too much of that. I think we are still a substantially unsustainable inflation country unless the economy turns down fairly hard in response to the credit uh, issues raised by the banking system. And we don't know yet whether that's going to happen. So in a sense, the outcomes here are a bit bifurcated. Either the banking crisis will pass without incident and without large impact on credit, in which case we really do have serious inflation issues and the Fed will have to tighten much more than is priced in or we're going to see some kind of real downturn uh, here. And I think both are plausible uh, outcomes. And I recognize that there's a chance we'll skate through right in between. But I'd have to say that seems very much uh, odds off uh, to me. Soft landings are very hard even in the best environment. So, Larry, I think I heard in your answer, we're going to have to wait to see what the aftermath of the banking kerfuffle has been here. But give us a sense of what you're expecting and, more important, what you're looking for. When will we know whether there's a credit crunch? The lesson of financial crises, if you study their history closely, is that it's not just all one big downturn. It was six months from Bear to Lehman. Even the week in which the Lehman events happened, the stock market went up and the Fed did not uh, cut rates. And the Fed statement that week was heavily about uh, inflation. So I think it's too early to give any kind of all clear sign. I think eventually we I think we've gotten to a point where I would say it's unlikely that there will be more panicked weekends with uh, bank runs. Not impossible by any means, but I'd say that's certainly less than a, well under a 50 percent chance. But whether you're going to see some other kind of accident, whether you're going to see a substantial restriction uh, in uh, credit, uh, that's not very clear. When you have a series of earthquake tremors, one's certainly hearing many anecdotes around constriction of credit. And the question really is, is that going to go nonlinear, where constriction of credit leads to declining asset prices, leads to non-performance of loans, leads to more uh, credit constriction? And I don't think we know yet whether it's going to go nonlinear. And I think we're going to be much of the way through the summer before I would feel comfortable being confident that it wasn't uh, going to go uh, nonlinear. Larry, one thing we do know at this point is that the FDIC is on the hook for a lot of money for guaranteeing all those deposits in the billions of dollars here. What do you make of the financial aspect of this, what the FDIC is putting up as opposed to what some of the banks are benefiting from? I'm surprised by how much the FDIC has had to spend on these resolutions relative to the things that were being said uh, earlier. They were hoping to sell SVB as a whole entity. And then in order to get somebody to buy it, they had to chip in a set of stuff that was cumulatively worth $20 billion. The arithmetic is similar relative to the scale of the bank. 
at uh, Signature uh, Bank. There are a lot of questions about those transactions. I'm still confused about why the holding company debt of SVP is um, still being uh, valued in a meaningful way. And I will want to see assurance that no executive there is getting deferred uh, compensation. But these were stunningly expensive transactions. Ultimately, everybody's going to say it's not coming back to taxpayers, but banks are taxpayers on behalf of people, their depositors, their customers, their people they uh, lend to. And the $23 billion the FDIC has spent is 100 bucks uh, per adult uh, American. And that's a fair amount. So I wonder if we can't be looking at the procedures uh, that they're using and finding ways to do better. And it looks like some of these deals were pretty attractive, given what happened to the shares of some of the acquiring banks. For and, SVG yeah, and, and I, so I think that, yeah, that's right, David. There, there are two parts of it. There are the what seem like huge gains that the banks that were lucky enough to get into this uh, got over 50 percent for the acquirer of SVB, close to 40 percent for the acquirer of uh, Signature. So there's that piece of it that they may have overpaid. There's also just a question of why it was necessary to pay so much. Larry, on a very different subject, we had, uh, for the first time in history, a former U.S. president indicted this week. Donald Trump was indicted for certain allegations. We're not even sure about what they all are yet, arising out of a hush payment that he was ma made. I really wonder about the connection of uh, our justice system with politics. You have talked on this program before about what's been going on over in Israel. What are the risks in Israel and here in the United States that we politicize our criminal justice system? David, uh, everyone, even former presidents of the United States, is entitled uh, to a presumption of innocence. God knows, I don't know uh, the facts of... Uh, those uh, matters. What I think we saw in Israel was that when there was a sense of the intertwining of politics and the basic rule of law and the judicial function, that had, in addition to all the other consequences, really quite problematic uh, financial and economic uh, consequences. And so I hope all the actors in this, both uh, President Trump and those who feel loyalty to him and those involved in carrying out this prosecution, will be doing their very best uh, to keep politics out of it, to act in ways that will provide reassurance that it is the rule of law that's being elevated rather than uh, the political side, because ultimately the ability to have a viable market economy rests on there being confidence uh, in the judiciary. And finally, we're going to try something new here that you suggested, sort of a, a quick round, lightning round of some issues and people and whether you are long or short on them. Let's start, first of all, with foreign direct investment in China. We had the premier over there, Li Qing, this week really make a case for why there should be more foreign investment in China, long or short? Short. Uh, deeds, not words, are most uh, important. And I think they're just enormous uncertainties about everything Chinese and about the Western response and that's going to chill investment substantially. Uh, Larry, you brought ChatGPT to Wall Street Week, and now we have something like 1,100 tech people who are writing a letter saying, let's hold off on this ChatGPT4. Let's make sure we know what we're doing before we keep moving forward. You long or short today on ChatGPT? I'm long uh, its continued development. Uh, one of the important developments in the last uh, several weeks has been uh, the engineering of the technology so that it can be used on much smaller uh, computers. And that means the genie's out of the bottle. 
There are going to be all kinds of people uh, doing all kinds of uh, things. And I think that this is going to be a story like other technology stories. It may take longer to think, longer to happen than you think it will, but ultimately it will happen faster and more pervasively than you thought it could. And finally, Larry, we talked about golf a fair amount. I know you're an avid golfer. We've got the Masters coming up next week. Uh, we've got two favorites right now, according to the betting odds. They are Scotty Scheffler and Rory McIlroy. Are you long or short Rory McIlroy? I'd be long uh, Rory. I think he's overdue, and I think this may well be his moment. Okay, Larry, thank you so very much. That's our special contributor here on Wall Street Week. He's Larry Summers of Harvard. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. Michael Kinsley famously said that a gaffe is when a politician tells the truth, some obvious truth he isn't supposed to say. To reach the level of the true gaffe, it isn't enough that a politician puts himself in an embarrassing situation and can't quite climb out of it. That happens all the time. Just last week, President Biden mistakenly mistook Canada for China and got roundly criticized for it. I applaud China for stepping up. Excuse me, I applaud Canada. But let's be honest, we all knew what he meant. Nor is it really a gaffe when a leader simply forgets how to spell, as then-Vice President Quayle did when he insisted a sixth grader at a spelling bee had to add an E onto the end of potato. Add one little bit on the end. You're right phonetically. What else? There you go. And of course, we've all watched former President Trump reach to make a point and found that his reach may have exceeded his grasp as when he praised the Continental Army of 1775 for seizing airports. Our army manned the airport. It ran the ramparts. It took over the airports. It did everything it had to do. And at Fort McHenry, under the rocket's red glare, it had nothing but victory. But none of these can be considered a true gaffe. Numb pointed at some basic truth that no one wanted to say. This week, we saw the results of a true gaffe in the banking world. When Credit Suisse was in the crosshairs earlier this month, Bloomberg's Manus Cranny asked the head of one of its major shareholders, the Saudi National Bank, whether it might double down on its investment. And his response was refreshingly clear and emphatic. The answer is absolutely not, for many reasons, outside the simplest reason, which is regulatory and statutory. We now own... Um, 9.8% of the bank. If we go above 10%, all kinds of new rules kick in, whether it be by our regulator or the European regulator or the Swiss regulator, and we're not inclined to get into a new regulatory regime. But sadly, speaking the truth clearly and directly is not always a defense. This week, SNB Chairman Amar Abdul Wahed Al Ghudari stepped down, reportedly for personal reasons. But just in terms of credibility and communication and guidance, they felt they had to do this move. They didn't explain why they replaced him as chairman, but it goes without saying that much of the recent turmoil probably has something to do with it. Score one for never answering a reporter's question directly. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.